Well, good morning, Redemption Church. My name is Joel Oates, and it is so good to see you here this morning. You know, perhaps you pulled us up online or you're tuning in by radio. Many of you might even be sitting and enjoying the company of your family and friends. But we want you to know that regardless of who you are, regardless of where you are, you are valuable. And we're so thankful that you've joined us this morning. And our prayer right now is that you feel so welcome that even though we're not in a building with four walls, you understand that you are loved and you belong. So something I constantly tell others and, and I'm telling you right now is that, is that here at Redemption Church, we love getting to know people. And one of the best ways for us to do that is by asking you to fill out one of our connection cards. If you notice in your chat box on the right-hand side of this video, or maybe you're on the Redemption app or webpage, you'll see a link that clearly says connect. It, would you do us a favor? Would you take the time to fill out that form um, and then click submit at the bottom? That's gonna allow us a chance to begin to connect with you, begin to pray with you, care for both you and your family. You know, when you fill out that card, you're gonna discover so many great ways to serve, get connected in community, or even how you can begin to be a part of what God is doing here at Redemption Church. You know, there's no better time to have people around you, especially in this season, that will love and care for you than right now. And we would love to make ourselves available to help you discover how to do just that. Again, it is such a joy to have you join us this morning. So let's join our hearts and our voices with our worship team to celebrate the greatness of our God. And again, thank you for being here this morning. Amen. Good morning, Redemption Church. We welcome you and want to remind you of the promise from Matthew 18 that says where two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus, that he is there among them. And we trust that promise this morning. We believe that Jesus is here that He hears us when we call out to Him. And so we invite you to sing with us, to cry out to the Lord. Let's sing together.
Lord, as there is freedom, let's sing this in confidence. Chains fall, fear bow here now. Jesus, you change everything. Life's healed, hope found here now. Jesus, you change everything. I won't bow to idols 
I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just the doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my soul will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified, let His praise arise. Christ be It always amazes me. The fact that our God is present in every aspect of our worship is both awe-inspiring and a bit humbling. You know, our lives were truly made for worship in every way. So as we continue on, this is the time in our service where we have the privilege to worship our God in the area of our finances. And we call this the tithe. This is where we get the opportunity to take the first 10% of what God has given to us and give it back to Him in an act of trust and obedience. You know, worshiping the Lord with our tithes and offerings, it's just one more way that we can tell God, we love you, we trust you, we believe that you're in control. And then He takes those gifts and He uses them to reach and care for thousands of people who have real needs and have maybe never heard the good news of Jesus before. You know, stepping into giving, it's never been easier. Uh, there are three easy ways that you can do this. You can go online at goredemption.com slash give, or you can text any amount that God lays on your heart to 84321, or you can always give by using our Redemption app that you currently have downloaded on your Apple or Android device. Let me say thank you. Thank you to all those that have already chosen to give and be faithful. It is truly the safest and easiest way. Again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for all that you've given to us. Thank you for all that you have provided for us. God, I pray that as we give back to you, that it would be an act of worship, an act that we trust you beyond our, uh, beyond our own control. Lord, you are in control and can do all things. So we faithfully give back to you and we worship you this morning. Jesus, we love you. Use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, Redemption Church. I want to challenge everyone to take the walk. The walk begins on both of our campuses. It's a guided tour through Scripture so that we can seek the Lord, repent of all known sin, ask God for revival, refreshing, and renewing. People have been taking the walk all week, some in the morning, some in the afternoon. Uh, some even came up when it was a little rainy, but others have walked it in the evening time. And we, we were inviting friends to come and guests and families and other churches, but we want you to come. Don't miss the point of the walk. The point of the walk is that God's people would be prepared to re-enter into his presence together. The church building is not the church. You are the church. So prepare yourself to re-enter a time when we can gather together and worship the Lord. Not only that, when you look at the world around you, don't you know that we need an awakening in our world? We need revival in the church. 
And so prepare yourself and take the walk. Tonight, I even saw someone in their car driving by each of the stations and praying. I want to encourage you, if you have any mobility issues, use your car on the North Campus, but also at our West Campus. People are showing up at all times to take the walk. So if you would, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Now, last week we were in Romans chapter 9, and we looked at God's sovereign right of election. His sovereign right of election. The debate between election and human responsibility has gone on throughout the ages. We pointed out last week that J.I. Packer said this is not a paradox, it's an antinomy. An antinomy are two principles that seem irreconcilable but undeniable at the same time. They seem, that's the key word, irreconcilable, but they're undeniable truths. They're not really at odds with one another, they're friends. Now, what's interesting is we see the same thing in nature. Albert Einstein showed the world that the properties of light are truly amazing because light is both wave and particle. Technically, that's impossible in science. Yet you and I can read that in a science book with light. There's another interesting thing in science and nature, and that's what's called the bumblebee paradox. Physicists tell us that the weight and the mass distribution and the short wingspan of a bumblebee should render it literally impossible of ever flying. Well, apparently the bumblebees did not get that memo because it's not stopped them from flying. You see, apparent contradictions in nature and in science are acceptable. Don't they, shouldn't they also be in the spiritual realm? You see, Paul lays out God's sovereignty in election. He has the right to choose whom he chooses. But don't confuse that with any other motive except that God wants you to have assurance that he is sovereign and in control of all things. When you think you chose him, he says, no, I chose you. When you think you picked the day to give your life to Christ, he goes, well, I knew that before the foundations of the earth. He said, but then what role did I have? We're going to look at that in this passage. Assurance of salvation is God's purpose in reminding us that he is utterly sovereign and in control. Never does God want us to blame his sovereign choice of election on our doubts or even our rejection of the gospel. You see, when Israel rejected Jesus as the Messiah, Paul never said that God didn't choose them. Matter of fact, he said quite the opposite. Paul points out the fact that though they were entitled to salvation in their minds, it was their birthright, they clearly, as a nation, rejected Jesus the Messiah. What's the point of this? God offers you a sincere invitation to receive him into your life. And if you reject him, it's all on you. If you receive him, It's all because of his glorious love for you. Be reminded in the doctrine of election that there are multiple verses, including 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. John Calvin, who's attributed to the whole idea of Calvinism, had a favorite life verse. It was Deuteronomy 29, 29. You know what it says? It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of his law. You see, the mystery of election belongs to God. I cannot understand it or perceive it. Yet I recognize it is his sovereign right to choose whom he chooses. But then there is this doctrine of human responsibility. And no speculation is needed. As a matter of fact, I think anyone can grasp this doctrine. Anyone can understand it, even from a child, that God makes us responsible for our lives and for the choices that we make with him. You see, today it seems like the world is falling apart. You didn't need me to tell you that. But there are people who look for assurance. We look for assurance in common institutions. We look for assurance in age-old trusted institutions. What we're watching is literally before our very eyes in our nation and around the world, a rocking of everything we put our trust in. Matter of fact, in Hebrews, it says everything that can shake will shake. This is a loose translation. But everything that can shake will shake that we might learn to trust what is unshakable. So let me just say it this way. 
Friend, if you want to be saved, salvation is nearer to you right now than it ever has been. And friend, if you are saved, security and affirmation that belongs to a believer who has put their trust in Jesus Christ is greater, more available to you right now than it ever has been. So let's think about human responsibility. That's the title of the message. Human responsibility contains two decisions to be saved and to know it. Two decisions that an unsaved person and a saved person must make when it comes to the doctrine of human responsibility. You say, Ed, what are those two decisions? The first one is a decision in our mind and our heart. Listen to me. And it is simply this, end human effort. That's an odd way to put it, but it's simply a command, end human effort to save you. We pick up at Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Who's the them that Paul's talking about? His heartbreak in chapter 9, verses, the first five verses, was for his race, his people, his, his, uh, his nation, his tribe, if you will, his religion. It was all wrapped up into one huge family called the Jewish people. Now, did you notice that Paul, even in chapter 10, verse 1, is passionately praying for the Jewish people to be saved? But you would say, but but Paul, if you believe in the sovereign election of God, why do you pray? Why do you witness? The simple answer from Paul and from your pastor is God commanded us to. You don't have to understand a doctrine like election to know that God wants to save people because he tells us he wants to save people. And it's like Spurgeon said, you you can't pull up their shirt tails and see if there's a yellow stripe down their back as if God would put that on those that are elect. He said, if I could, I'd go throughout London pulling up shirt tails, looking for those who are elect, and I would preach the gospel to them. He said, no, instead we preach whosoever will may come. Verse one, look at verse two, for I bear them witness that they, talking about the Jewish people, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You see, the Jewish response to Jesus was not from a lack of zeal for God, quite the opposite. You see, sincerity is never the standard of a genuine conversion experience. Let me say that again. Sincerity is never the standard for a genuine conversion experience. Uh, In our culture, it is anathema to tell anyone they are sincerely wrong because everybody believes sincerity is the the epitome, the utmost Man, you can believe anything you want as long as you are sincere in your belief. There's a lot of doctrine, a lot of false doctrine today, a lot of people today who believe that's how you get to heaven. Just be sincere. Friend, you can be sincerely wrong. Their zeal was not based in the knowledge of God. And I would say that there are many people in churches all across America and around the world who have a zeal, but it's not according to the word of God. So, So their zeal was not based on the knowledge of God and primarily through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Zeal and religion can take you to some dark places. Zeal and religion is what leads to terrorism that we've seen in the last 25 years increasing. See, it is not wrong to be zealous for God in the sense that if you are zealous because of a passionate love for God because he first loved you and saved you out of some mess, You see, zeal without knowledge is stupidity. Knowledge without zeal is passivity. And that's a very important statement. Now let's look at verse 3. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, that is, they did not submit to God's righteousness. You see, these people that he's praying for believed because they were of, a, of the same race, Judaism, that they had a ticket, if you will, to heaven. They believed that they were special, that they were all going to heaven. But he says here, they, they didn't do that according to the knowledge of God, and they wouldn't even submit to Christ's righteousness. At the end of the day, there are two basic approaches today for people who want to come to God. Number one, you establish your own righteousness. You see, most religions in the world today preach a message of do. D-O, do. Do this, do that. And they have a whole list of things. Different teachers, different philosophers, different gurus, different rabbis, priests, bishops, whatever. Say, this is what you do, and we're a doing people. And it's attractive to us. That's what religion teaches. 
That's one route people say will get you to God. In fact, there's a second way. It's the only way. It's the way Jesus said is the only way to get to God, and that is righteousness is a free gift. Righteousness is not called what you do. It's called what Jesus has done. It is not do. It's done. It is finished. It is complete. You see, if you think you can do enough, hear me, friend. If you think you can do enough, beyond the pride of that, beyond the recklessness of that, beyond how contrary that is to the Word of God, if you think you can do enough, then God owes you something. But the Word of God says that He owes us nothing and that it was done at the cross. If you and I could see God for one split second, think about that. If we could see God for one split second, It would be like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Go read the first five verses and see, the first ten verses. Isaiah chapter 6 tells the story of Isaiah suddenly being transported, either in his heart, and his mind, in a dream, in a vision, or he was actually there. Whatever it was, he's standing before God, and what does he do? Boom! He does carpet time. What does he do? He goes flat down on his face, and he's not the only one. Throughout Scripture, uh, Ezekiel did that, Daniel did that, Moses did that, Paul did that, John on the Isle of Patmos did that. You see, there's something about the holiness of God that in his presence we go flat down on our face. Every religion says you must do to be accepted by God. I obey, therefore I will be accepted. But the gospel says Jesus Christ accepts you and now your heart has been changed by his love. Now you want to obey. C.S. Lewis said it well, as he always did. What separates Christianity from every other religion is grace. We obey in gratitude and love for the God who saves us, not in order to gain his favor. Look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul, what a statement you just made. The law ends at the feet of Jesus. The law is what the Jewish people and what people even today, the rules, keeping the rules, whatever those are, either you make them up or somebody gave them to you or you learned them as a child, but the rules lead you to a certain place. But I want to tell you something, they lead you to an end. There's a place where the path stops. The the law can only take you so far is what Paul says. But guess who is standing where the law ends? And it's Jesus Christ. Why does it end at him? Because he fulfilled the law completely. By his grace we are saved. The law's job is to show us how sinful we are, how dead we are. The law's job is to show us that we are incapable of saving ourselves. And it also shows us that Jesus perfectly satisfied all that God had for us. We say it this way. Jesus lived the life I was supposed to live but failed to live. And he died the death I deserved to die in my place. So he fulfilled the law completely. And and when God sees me, when I believe in him, when I stop my human effort and I put my trust in him, the Bible says that when God sees me, is it looking, it's it's as if he's looking at Jesus. And all that Jesus did has been credited to me. And all that I did had been credited to his cross. When I was uh, 12 years old, uh, my parents enrolled me in a school that was a Lutheran school. And I just want to tell you something, I love Lutherans because of that school. They were good people, they were good to me, but one of the things they forced me to do in middle school was to take the Lutheran catechism. Well, they were trying to convert this Baptist kid, but I'm just going to tell you something, they couldn't do it. But I fell in love with Martin Luther, and I love to tell stories of Luther. Matter of fact, I quote him so much, some of you think he's on staff here. He's not. He's been, he's been dead for a long time. But Luther's conversion is an amazing experience. He was a Catholic priest in Germany. But he was so serious about his unrighteousness. He had this dread that he thought he would die and go to hell because of his sin. And when he read scripture, he read it like some of you do. as just angry, that God is angry at my sin, that God is going to punish me in hell forever. And he never felt clean enough, never felt good enough. As a matter of fact, the other priest in his community and the other priest in his parish, he would wear them out in the confessional booth. He would show up at confession. They would run. They didn't want to listen to him because he would go on for hours and hours confessing sins that they thought were minor. So what do you do when you think somebody, when when you think your pastor's losing his mind? They made him a professor in a college. (laughs) And his first task, this is awesome, his first task was to teach all of the Pauline epistles. Pauline's not Paul's wife, it's Paul. All the things he wrote, and they started with the first one that appears in the Bible, It wasn't the first one he wrote, but the first one that appears in the Bible is the book of Romans. And it was there that the gospel was set on fire in Luther's heart. 
At the end of the law, Martin Luther found himself standing there realizing the grace of God, that God would forgive us of our sins, that it isn't in my damnable doing, it is in what has been done by Jesus Christ. And these two approaches to God, only one of them works, and only one is going to satisfy the longing of your heart. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a longing in your heart you cannot explain. There's a depression and a discouragement in your life that you cannot understand. It's because God is not real to you. Or God has stopped being real to you. And you have stopped seeing the glory of all that he's done for you. And God tonight, today, is calling you back to himself. Look at verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. What is he saying? It's very simple. It's very straightforward. If you could be saved by righteousness in the law, even Moses said, then you better do the law. You better do it exactly. You better never fail. Perfection, the law was put before us so that we would understand that we are all broken and we are all incapable. Let me ask you something. Do you think that that news, that you have to keep all of the law in order to save yourself, do you think that's encouraging or discouraging? Oh, my friend, no wonder people are hopeless. If you thought the world could never change, and if you thought you could never change, if you thought that you were going to be this way forever, you would give up all hope. But friend, God broke into human history 2,000 years ago through his son, Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. He lived the life I was supposed to live and failed to live. You've heard that. But then he died in our place on the cross for the sins of the world where the law stopped. Jesus began to shine in all of his glory. Friend, you need to be encouraged today. Salvation is closer than it's ever been to your life. God is here right now. He's working in your heart. Look at verse 6. But the righteousness, Paul writes, based on faith says, now watch this, do not say to your heart who will ascend into heaven that he might bring Christ down, or whom will descend to the abyss that he may bring Christ up from the dead. There's an interesting impulse in human beings, and we see it even back in the book of Genesis when a, a, a group of people decided to build a tower that would go up to heaven. It's called the Tower of Babel. They wanted to ascend to heaven, and, and, and we can question what their motives might have been. Pride, arrogance, of course, but what they ultimately wanted to do was go get God. And see, there's something in all of us that wants to think that, that I've got to go get God. Friend, God came to get you. And so from the Tower of Babel to this day, and what, what Paul is saying here is don't think you can climb to heaven on a ladder someplace. By the way, Jacob's ladder, and the ladder that's Jacob's ladder that's mentioned in the New Testament was never for Jacob. He never climbed the ladder. It was for God to come into this world. It wasn't for him to go to God. It was for Jesus to come to you. And so when Jesus called Nathaniel, he said, he said, I saw you under that tree. He said, you are the Messiah. He goes, you say that? He said, you're going to see greater things than that. You're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is the ladder, not that you climb, but who came to you. So, can you do these things? Can you go into the depths of the abyss and pull Jesus up from the grave to raise him to life? Can you ascend into heaven and drag him down from his throne? No. Friend, righteousness is not a quest. You cannot dive deep enough. You cannot rise high enough. Before the world or time even existed, God chose you as his sovereign purpose, and God is calling you by his Holy Spirit. Jesus paid in full. He was buried in the depths. He rose again from the dead. You cannot save yourself by zeal or intellect or effort. Luther said the only thing you can do, and he used two, two analogies. He said two things. One, you receive it as gift righteousness, or he called it theologically alien righteousness. Gift righteousness means it's a gift that God gives you. You must receive it. But it's also alien in that it doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from this earth. It comes from God himself. God did not find you or me righteous. He makes us righteous. You see, at the end of human effort is the beginning of repentance and faith. The first words out of Jesus' mouth in the book of the Gospel of Mark, Mark 1.15, he said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You see, no human effort. We've got to stop the human effort to try to get to God. We've got to stop it. But there's something else we've got to do. 
And these are two sides of the same coin. We've got to stop the human effort. And then number two, we've got to exercise saving faith. Look at verse eight. We exercise saving faith. In verse eight, he says, but what does it say? The word is near you. Did you see that? I love that. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. You see, what you may not realize is God sent me into your house, to your home, to your, to your object, whatever you're watching this on, your phone, your iPad, or whatever it is, or maybe on the big screen of your house. But, but watch this. God sent me to proclaim this truth to you this word of faith. We must exercise saving faith. Because of Jesus, salvation is so close. It's closer than it's ever been. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. No matter how dark your circumstances are, no matter how far away you feel from God, no matter how bleak your prospects are, salvation is believing upon and confessing Jesus Christ. Look at verse nine. Because if you confess him with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you have your Bible, underline that last phrase. You will be saved. You see, these two things go together. They're not separate acts or deeds. Matter of fact, one flows from the other. These two go together. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and you will confess him with your mouth. You know, at the first Passover that the Jewish people experienced in the Exodus, Uh, the Lord told them to take the blood of a spotless lamb and to sacrifice it for the meal that they would celebrate called the Passover. And then to take the blood and put it on the doorpost, a horizontal and a vertical swipe. What a picture. The horizontal and the vertical swipe on their door. And so that the death angel would pass over their house if he saw the blood. But you gotta know for a moment, that person who had, who had prepared the lamb and had taken the blood in a bowl was going out and he's thinking to himself, hey, this may really make Pharaoh angry if we do this. He may think we're rebelling and we've already been in slavery to him. We don't need more abuse from him. Let's just do this. Let's go to the laundry room right off the kitchen or let's let's go to the the pantry. Let's paint the door there. It's still our house. Inside, nobody sees it. Then you miss the purpose of it. The purpose of it is that we would declare that the blood of Jesus Christ, ultimately the Lamb of God, without any blemish or stain would take away the sins of the world. You see, friends, you can't accept Jesus in your heart, but refuse to confess him to the world. You got to come out. And I know these are times where people are rejecting everything traditional. They're rejecting old norms. They're rejecting even the church and they have all their reasons. But hear me, friend, this is the time to stand. This is the time to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. A genuine belief in heart makes a public confession of faith. Did you hear that? A genuine belief in your heart cannot remain silent. Look at verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So, pastor, are you saying if I get baptized, that's when I get saved? No. When I take the supper, when I walk the aisle, When I open up my wallet and give, as tempting as it is, no, that's not, no. The Bible says with the heart you believe and with the mouth you confess and it results in salvation. So why start with the heart? Because that's where all life change has to start. You can say my hand made me do this. You can say my circumstances made me do wrong. You can say my feet took me into places I should not have gone. You can blame circumstantially and Americans are really good at blaming everything. But you gotta own it. You gotta say the problem isn't my hands, it's not my feet. The problem isn't my head. The problem isn't my brain. The problem is my heart. The Bible says the heart is desperately wicked and needs to be saved. Look at verse 11. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. You see, everything you trust about yourself, everything you trust about your culture, everything you trust about religious ways, can I tell you something? They will all put you to shame one day. If you think that you can be good enough to earn God's favor, I'm good with the man upstairs. I hear people say, I'm good, I'm fine. I don't need Jesus. I got this going thing. I know what I'm doing. I'm a good person. I'm better than most. And it's interesting. We always compare ourselves to Adolf Hitler or Paul Pott or, or Stalin or, or, or somebody, somebody way out there that just was brutal. And we think, well, I'm better than them. I haven't murdered anybody. But oh, my friend, you gotta, you're gonna stand before God and here, depart from me for I never knew you. What God wants is a relationship with you. And it's a simple 
as an illustration we use a lot here at Redemption Church. It's called the chair illustration. When you're tired and you need to sit down, you look at a chair and you trust that those four legs are going to be able to support you. You plop down on it. Most people don't inspect it. Most people don't hold it up and check it out. Can it hold me? But you just give yourself to it. It's the same way with the gospel. You give yourself to Jesus Christ. You put all of you on all of him, and you trust that he knows how to save you and change you. You say, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid I won't be able to keep the rules. There are no rules, if you will. There's just the righteousness of God. What he wants you to do is first he wants to save you, and then he wants to teach you his word so that you'll know his heart. And, and he never wanted you to keep rules. He wants you to love him from your heart. And you'll long to do the things that Jesus Christ said to do. Look at verse 12. And this is really good. This is such a good reminder of where we're at at this hour. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call to him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, God's saving grace is not limited to ethnicity or background or education or religious past or moral blamelessness. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not might be saved not will be saved after a probationary period, but the moment you believe upon Jesus Christ from the heart and you confess him with your lips, you will be saved. And notice something about this salvation that's pointed out here. He says, he says there's no distinction between the Jew or the Greek, the Jew and the Gentile. Let me tell you why this is important, because that was the greatest racial division at the time of Jesus and the time of Paul when he wrote this. They both despised each other. They looked down on each other for different reasons but they nonetheless thought of themselves as separated from those people. What would be the racial distinctions in our land? You don't even have to guess. Between black and white, black and brown, white and brown. Racial distinctions of other people from other languages, other places, people don't look like us, people don't vote like us, and people don't think like us. You see, this is very important because the gospel not only changes our heart toward God, it changes our heart toward other people. Our national nightmare that we are in the midst of right now in America of racial tension would not exist if the church believed and practiced what Paul is saying here, that there is no distinction. The reason we have churches full of one color and churches full of another color, there's all kinds of reasons for it, but at the end of the day is that we are making distinctions. And especially for a child of God, may I say this, I understand if you're afraid of a thug someplace that's in the back of a, of a protest line throwing a, a Molotov cocktail. I understand that's your fear, but I want you to hear me, hear me clearly. There are believers all over this city don't look like you, vote like you, or think like you, but they love Jesus because Christ has saved them. Shouldn't you be a brother and a sister to them? Shouldn't you open your arms to them? At least them. Not even counting the lostness in our community that could be transformed if we would love one another. The gospel of Jesus offers the most inclusive exclusivity in the world. Did you hear what I just said? You say, that's another paradox. It kind of is, but the gospel is inclusive. Whosoever will may come. And it's exclusive in this. It's only through Christ you can be saved. So, our acceptance is not based on anything about us, but everything about him. We need to end our human effort and we need to exercise saving faith. What made the gospel scandalous in the Bible is because of who it included. Now that's odd. It wasn't who was excluded, who was included. We see Jesus drawn to a woman who only had a half a cent, a woman who had too many husbands, a woman with seven demons, a woman who was hemorrhaging for 13 years, a rich man with questions. In the book of Acts, an Ethiopian eunuch who was searching. Jesus encountered Roman soldiers, men who led into battle and to war, and their lives were transformed because he brought them in, he embraced them. So why is open confession of faith in Christ important? Why is it important that I confess? You know, on the walk, one of the things we ask you to do when you start at, at sign number one is we ask you to, uh, out loud, read the scripture that's on the sign. All that's on the sign is a scripture and a number. 
and the logo, the walk. And we, we ask you to read it out loud. And as you walk from there to station number two or three, we ask you to pray. Whatever the Holy Spirit of God impresses upon your heart in that scripture. Why? Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But also God spoke the world into existence with a word. God's word is powerful. Child of God, listen to me. Revival will come when we become a people of the book, not just people who hold it up, not just people who say they believe it, but people who read it, people who let it read them, people who love the word, memorize the word, not to show off, but so that it will change and transform our character. Why is open confession important? Because the power is in the word of God. And I'm telling you, you can say, Pastor Ed, I got this devil that's bothering me. Can you come rebuke him? Friend, the, the weakest believer among us can speak the word of God. And the Bible says Satan has to flee. That is why it is so important. Because the word of God needs to dwell richly within you. I learned to love Martin Luther as a middle schooler. And I think the thing that captured my heart the most about the great reformer was that one day he was drug into a court, not like we think of a court of law, it was an ecclesiastical court. The mother church had sent Cardinal Cajetan to prosecute him for heresy. They were very kind toward Martin at first, but then it turned dark. And finally at the point when they looked at all of his writings, substitutionary, atonement, faith, grace by faith alone, in Christ alone. When they began to see these great doctrines that Luther was just opening back up to the sunshine of the world, they looked at him and they said in Latin, revoco, revoco, I recant. They said, Luther, you must, you must recant what you have taught. Just one word, the cardinal said, one word, revoco and you shall live. Listen to what Luther said. This much I know. I would rather be the most beloved person in the empire if I were to say the simple word revoco. But how can I deny the power through which I have been made a Christian? Then Luther didn't say revoco. He said credo. I believe. I believe. One of the greatest hymns ever written in all of time was written by Martin Luther. He wrote the words, and one of the verses in A Mighty Fortress is Our God says, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. Oh, my friend, I want you to meet the word. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. He's the living word that wants to come into your life if you will but believe in your heart and confess him as Lord. I'm going to ask you to do it right now. Maybe you're in a living room with your family. I just ask you to stand up in front of your family. I can't imagine people who would be more in love with you, more willing to celebrate if you would just say with me right now, I believe in Jesus, the resurrected Son of God who paid for my sins. I believe in him in my heart, and I confess him. Jesus Christ is Lord, and he has saved me by the faith of what I believe and confess. Oh, my friend, maybe you're by yourself. Then we're going to tell you how you can let us know that you have just right now in your heart. And by the way, letting us know is maybe the way you will confess. I, I'm just going to tell you. I just trusted Christ as my Savior. You sit on that chair. You put all of your weight on him. All of who you are. You say, my sin, all of it. My ugliness, all of it. My flaws, all of it. My, my crippled nature, all of it. And he receives you just as you are. That he will not leave you like you are. Oh, my friend, transformation and hope 
has just been born in you. Lord Jesus, would you bless those who right now are standing in their families, right now standing with some friends and declaring, I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. I have just been saved for the glory of God by the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Oh, my friend, welcome to the family of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes will not perish they shall have eternal Shall hold to the cross. I shall hold to God alone, for His love has salvaged me. For His love has set me.
What a reality and a promise that our God is sovereign over all. Maybe God grabbed hold of your heart this morning in some way. We would love to celebrate that decision with you and begin to walk alongside you in your newfound faith in Christ. Would you do me a favor? Would you take your phone out right now and would you text us the word NEW LIFE to 63566, all one word. This will allow us a chance to begin to follow up with you, to pray with you and begin supporting you in this new life-changing decision you just made. You know, maybe you just need some prayer or maybe you want someone to pray with you. One of the easiest ways for us to do that is by asking you to go to the link that you see currently below. It's goredemption.com slash prayer. You can be assured that someone's gonna begin praying for you and bringing your requests daily before the Lord. Finally, for all those who've joined us this morning, thank you. What a joy to have you tune in and worship together with us. You know, Jesus is alive and well and he's truly in control of all things. What a promise that we can count on no matter the circumstances we may be walking through or you're walking through right now. So may your hope always be found in him. We don't dismiss here at Redemption Church. We always send. So you are a sent people this morning. Be a light to all the world. And we'll see you this week.